Chapter Nine, Part Two of the Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter Nine, Turning of the Foe, Part Two. Meanwhile, the victorious Southerners were spending a few moments in enjoying their triumph. They captured great quantities of food and clothing, which Kenley had not found time to destroy, and which they joyously divided among themselves. Harry found the two colonels and all the rest of the Invincibles lying upon the ground in the fields. Some of them were wounded, but most were unhurt. They were merely panting from exhaustion. Colonel Leonidas Talbot sat up when he saw Harry, and Lieutenant Colonel Hector St. Hilaire also sat up. "'Good afternoon, Harry,' said Colonel Talbot politely. "'It's been a warm day, but a victorious one, sir.' "'Victorious, yes, but it's not finished. I fancy that in spite of everything we have not yet learned the full capabilities of General Jackson. Eh, Hector?' "'No, sir, we haven't,' replied Lieutenant Colonel Hector St. Hilaire emphatically. I never saw such an appetite for battle. In Mexico, General Winfield Scott would press the enemy hard, but he was not anxious to march twenty miles and fight a battle every day. Harry found St. Clair and Langdon not far away from their chief officers. St. Clair had brushed the dust off his clothing, but he was regarding ruefully two bullet holes in the sleeve of his fine gray tunic. He has neither needle nor thread with which to sew up those holes said Langdon, with a wicked glee, and he must go into battle again with a tunic more holy than righteous. It's been a bad day for clothes. A man doesn't fight any worse because he's particular about his uniform, does he? asked St. Clair. You don't, that's certain, old fellow, said Langdon, clapping him on the back, and just think how much worse it might have been. Those bullets, instead of merely going through your coat sleeve, might have gone through your arm also, shattering every bone in it. Now, Harry, you ride with old Jack. Tell us what he means to do. Are we going to rest on our rich and numerous laurels, or is it up and after the Yank's hot foot? He's not telling me anything, replied Harry, but I think it's safe to predict that we won't take any long and luxurious rest, nor will we ever take any long and luxurious rest while we're led by Stonewall Jackson. Jackson marched some distance farther toward Strasburg, where the army of Banks yet unbelieving lay, and as the night was coming on thick and black with clouds, went into camp. But among their captured stores they had ample food now, and tents and blankets to protect themselves from the promised rain. The Acadians, who were wonderful cooks, showed great culinary skill as well as martial courage. They were becoming general favorites, and they prepared all sorts of appetizing dishes, which they shared freely with the Virginians, the Georgians, and the others. Then the irrepressible band began. In the fire-lighted woods and on the ground yet stained by the red of battle, it played quaint old tunes, waltzes and polkas and roundelays, and once more the stalwart Pierres and Raouls and Luciennes and Etiennes, clasping one another in their arms, whirled in wild dances before the fires. The heavy clouds opened by and by, and then all save the sentinels fled to shelter. Harry and Dalton, who had been watching the dancing, went to a small tent, which had been erected for themselves and two more. Next to it was a tent yet smaller, occupied by the commander-in-chief. And as they passed by it, they heard low but solemn tones lifted in invocation to God. Harry could not keep from taking one fleeting glance. He saw Jackson on his knees, and then he went quickly on. The other two officers had not yet come, and Dalton and he were alone in the tent. It was too dark inside for Harry to see Dalton's face, but he knew that his comrade, too, had seen and heard. "'It will be hard to beat a general who prays,' said Dalton. "'Some of our men laugh at Jackson's praying, but I've always heard that the Puritans, whether in England or America, were a stern lot to face. The enemy at least won't laugh at him.' I've heard that they had great fun deriding a praying professor of mathematics, but I fancy they've quit it. If they haven't, they'll do so when they hear of Front Royal. 
The tent was pitched on the bare ground, but they had obtained four planks, every one about a foot wide and six feet or so long. They were sufficient to protect them from the rain, which would run under the tent and soak into the ground. Harry had long since learned that a tent and a mere strip of plank were a great luxury, and now he appreciated them at their full value. He wrapped himself in the invaluable cloak, stretched his weary body upon his own particular plank, and was soon asleep. He was awakened in the night by a low, droning sound. He did not move on his plank, but lay until his eyes became used partially to the darkness. And then he saw two other figures, also wrapped in their cloaks, and stretched on their planks, dusky and motionless. But the fourth figure was kneeling on his plank, and Harry saw that it was Dalton, praying even as Stonewall Jackson had prayed. Then Harry shut his eyes. He was not devout himself, but in the darkness of the night, with the rain beating a tattoo on the canvas walls of the tent, he felt very solemn. This was war, red war, and he was in the midst of it. War meant destruction, wounds, agony, and death. He might never again see Pendleton and his father and his aunt and his cousin Dick Mason and Dr. Russell and all his boyhood and school friends. It was no wonder that George Dalton prayed. He ought to be praying himself and lying there and not stirring. He said under his breath a simple prayer that his mother had taught him when he was yet a little child. Then he fell asleep again and woke no more until the dawn. But while Harry slept, the full dangers of his situation became known to Banks far after midnight at Strasburg. The regiment and the two guns that he had sent down the turnpike to relieve Kenley had been fired upon so incessantly by southern pickets and riflemen that they were compelled to turn back. Everywhere the northern scouts and skirmishers were driven in. Despite the darkness and rain, they found a wary foe whom they could not pass. It was nearly two o'clock in the morning when Banks was aroused by a staff officer who said that a man insisted upon seeing him. The man, the officer said, claimed to have news that meant life or death, and he carried on his person a letter from President Lincoln empowering him to go where he pleased. He had shown that letter, and his manner indicated the most intense and overpowering anxiety. Banks was surprised, and he ordered that the stranger be shown in at once. A tall man, wrapped in a long coat of yellow oilcloth, dripping rain, was brought into the room. He held a faded blue cap in his hand, and the general noticed that the hand was sinewy and powerful. The front of the coat was open a little at the top, disclosing a dingy blue coat. His high boots were spattered to the tops with mud. There was something in the man's stern demeanor and his intense burning gaze that daunted Banks, who was a brave man himself. Moreover, the general was but half-dressed, and had risen from a warm couch, while the man before him had come in on the storm, evidently from some great danger, and his demeanor showed that he was ready for other and instant dangers. For the moment, the advantage was with the stranger, despite the difference in rank. "'Who are you?' asked the general. "'My name, sir, is Shepard, William J. Shepard. I am a spy or a scout in the Union service.' I have concealed upon me a letter from President Lincoln, empowering me to act in such a capacity and to go where I please. Do you wish to see it, sir? Shepard spoke with deference, but there was no touch of servility in his tone. Show me the letter, said Banks. Shepard thrust a hand into his waistcoat and withdrew a document which he handed to the general. Banks glanced through it rapidly. It's from Lincoln, he said. I know that handwriting, but it would not be well for you to be captured with that upon you. If I were about to be captured, I should destroy it. Why have you come here? What message do you bring? The worst possible message, sir. Stonewall Jackson and an army of twenty thousand men will be upon you in the morning. What? What is this you say? It was only a cavalry raid at Front Royal. It was no cavalry raid at Front Royal, sir. It was Jackson and his whole army. I ought to have known, sir. I should have got there and warned Kenley in time, but I could not. My horse was killed by a rebel sharpshooter in the woods as I was approaching. I could not get up in time, but I saw what happened. Kenley? K 
Kenley, where is he? Mortally wounded or dead, and his army is destroyed. They made a brave stand, even after they were defeated at the village. They might have got away, had anybody but Jackson been pursuing. But he gave them no chance. They were enveloped by cavalry and infantry, and only a few escaped. Good God! exclaimed Banks, aghast. Nor is that all, sir. They are close at hand. They will attack you at dawn. They are in full force. Ewell's army has joined Jackson, and Jackson leads them all. We must leave Strasburg at once, or we are lost. Shepard's manner admitted of no doubt. Banks hurried forth and sent officers to question the pickets. All the news they brought was confirmatory. Even in the darkness and rain, shots had been fired at them by southern skirmishers. Banks sent for all of his important officers. The troops were gathered together, and leaving a strong rear guard, they began a rapid march toward Winchester, which Jackson had loved so well. Swiftness and decision now on the other side had saved the Northern Army from destruction. Banks did not realize until later, despite the urgent words of Shepard, how formidable was the danger that threatened him. Jackson, despite all the disadvantages of the darkness and the rain, wished to get his army up before daylight, but the deep mud formed by the pouring rain enabled Banks to slip away from the trap. The southern troops, moreover, were worn to the bone. They had come ninety miles in five days, over rough roads, across streams, without bridges, and over a high mountain, besides fighting a battle of uncommon fierceness. There were limits even to the endurance of Jackson's foot cavalry. Harry was first awake in the little tent. He sat up and looked at the other three on their planks, who were sleeping as if they would never wake any more. A faint tint of dawn was appearing at the open flap of the door. The four had lain down, dressed fully, and Harry, as he sprang from his board, cried, Up, boys, up! The army is about to move! The three also sprang to their feet and went outside. Although the dawn was as yet faint, the army was awakening rapidly, or rather was being awakened. The general himself appeared a moment later, dressed fully, the end of a lemon in his mouth, his face worn and haggard by incredible hardships, but his eyes full of the strength that comes from an unconquerable will. He nodded to Harry, Dalton, and the others. Five minutes for breakfast, gentlemen, he said, and then join me on horseback, ready for the pursuit of the enemy. The few words were like the effects of a galvanic battery on Harry, peculiarly susceptible to mental power. Jackson was always a stimulus to him. Close contact revealed to him the fiery soul that lay underneath the sober and silent exterior, and, in his own turn, he caught fire from it. Youthful, impressionable, and extremely sensitive to great minds and great deeds, Stonewall Jackson had become his hero, who could do no wrong. Five minutes for the hasty breakfast, and they were in the saddle, just behind Jackson. The rain had ceased. The sun was rising in a clear sky. The country was beautiful once more, and on a long line the southern bugles were merrily singing the advance. Very soon scattered shots all along their front showed that they were in touch with the enemy. The infantry and cavalry left by Banks as a curtain between himself and Jackson did their duty nobly that morning. The pursuit now led into a country covered with forest, and using every advantage of such shelter, the northern companies checked the southern advance as much as was humanly possible. Many of them were good riflemen, particularly those from Ohio, and the cavalry of Ashby, Funston, and Sherburne found the woods very warm for them. Horses were falling continually, and often their riders fell with them to stay. Harry, in the center with the commander, heard the heavy firing to both right and left, and he glanced often at Jackson. He saw his lips move as if he were talking to himself, and he knew that he was disappointed at this strong resistance. Troops could move but slowly through the woods in the face of heavy rifle fire, and meanwhile Banks with his main body was escaping to Winchester. "'Mr. Kenton,' said Jackson sharply, "'ride to General Ashby. Tell him to push the enemy harder. We must crush at least a portion of this army. It is vital.' Harry was off as soon as the last words left the general's lips. He spurred his horse from the turnpike, leaped a low rail fence, and galloped across a field toward a forest, where Ashby's cavalry were advancing and the rifles were cracking fast. 
Bullets from the northern skirmishers flew over him and beside him as he flew about the field, but he thought little of them. He was growing so thoroughly inured to war that he seldom realized the dangers until they were past. Neither he nor his horse was hurt. Their very speed perhaps saved them, and they entered the wood where the southern cavalry were riding. General Ashby, he cried to the first man he saw, where is he? I have a message from General Jackson. The soldier pointed to a figure on horseback, but a short distance away, and Harry galloped up. General Jackson asks you to press the enemy harder, he said to Ashby. He wishes him to be driven in rapidly. A faint flush came into the brown cheeks of Ashby. He shall be obeyed, he replied. We're about to charge in full force. Hold, young man. You can't go back now. You must charge with us. He put his hand on Harry's rein as he spoke, and the boy saw that a strong force of northern cavalry had now appeared in the fields directly between him and his general. Ashby turned the next instant to a bugler at his elbow and exclaimed fiercely, Blow! Blow with all your might! The piercing notes of the charge rang forth again and again. Ashby, shouting loudly and continuously, and waving his sword above his head, galloped forward. His whole cavalry force galloped with him and swept down upon the defenders. Nor did Ashby lack support. The Acadians, led by Taylor, swung forward on a run, and a battery, coming at the double-quick, unlimbered and opened fire. Jackson had directed all. He had brought up the converging lines and the whole northern rear guard. Two thousand cavalry, some infantry, and a battery were caught. Just before them lay the little village of Middleton, and in an instant they were driven into its streets, where they were raked by shot and shell from the cannon, while the rifles of the cavalry and of the Louisiana troops swept them with bullets. Again the northern soldiers, brave and tenacious though they might be, could make no stand against the terrible rush of Jackson's victorious and superior numbers. They had no such leading as their foes. The man, the praying professor, was proving himself everything. As at Front Royal, the northern force was crushed. It burst from the village in fragments and fled in many directions. But Jackson urged on the pursuit. Ashby's cavalry charged again and again, taking prisoners everywhere. The people of Middleton, as red-hot for the south as were those of Front Royal, rushed from their houses and guided the victors along the right roads. They pointed where two batteries and a train of wagons were fleeing toward Winchester, and Ashby, with his cavalry and Harry still at his elbow, raced in pursuit. End of chapter 9, part 2